to welcome you to the second global diaspora virtual exchange titled Maximizing Diaspora Engagement, Mobilizing Resources. Since uh, 2018, iDiaspora has been contributing to the empowerment of diaspora communities to engage as development actors. iDiaspora is, as you probably very well know by now, a digital venue where diasporas and stakeholders connect, share information and learn from each other to share best practices on how to better engage with their communities to contribute to development. In 2020, I Diaspora organized three global virtual exchanges in an effort to exchange the dialogue between diasporas and stakeholders responding to COVID-19, to the pandemic. These events demonstrated that uh, diasporas have skills and capacities to contribute to their communities through prevention, protection, relief and recovery efforts. Diasporas contribute by developing interventions across health, social and economic sectors. While these uh, events shed light on the great potential of diasporas for development, transitional communities recognize that they are facing three specific challenges. Number one, preventing them uh, 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 preventing them to reach their full potential. That's number one, lack of trust. Number two, difficulties obtaining funding. And thirdly, sustainability of their initiatives in, uh, long, in the long term. The first global exchange this year held um, yeah, uh, exactly a month ago on 27th of April, focused on building trust. During this event, our distinguished panel of experts unpacked the concept of trust. Mutual trust between stakeholders engaging with diasporas is key to build up long-term relations. Trust in diaspora engagement is the result of inclusive, inclusivity, transparency, and accountability efforts. Trust is based on mutual understanding of each other's interests and capacities. During the first global exchange, we learned that trust is built over time and it, requir it requires openness honestly and consistency from all the parties involved. Building trust is a constant effort and so seeking for financial resources. Today, we will focus on how to mobilize resources to feed diaspora engagement initiatives. In particular, we will uh, identify the main challenges that diasporas face while seeking resources to fund their activities and what strategies they establish to overcome these constraints. Before passing the floor to our panelists and uh, the first session, let me once again express my gratitude uh, for this opportunity to be with you and wish you and all of us a very fruitful discussion. And with that being said, I am pleased uh, to pass the floor to uh, the first, uh, to the moderator of the first session, that session focusing on mobilizing resources in diaspora engagement and will be moderated by Eric Guichard, who is the CEO of uh, Home Strings. Eric, I hope you are online and with us, and uh, the floor is here, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Manfred. Uh, thank you very much for those uh, opening uh, remarks. Uh, as a moderator of today's session, I want to welcome everybody. I see that the count is steadily increasing. We currently stand at uh, 33, all uh, included. Um, I would like to start by uh, uh, covering a few housekeeping uh, matters um, and then sort of describe the, uh, the process uh, uh, for today. Um, we have an exciting uh, panel of, uh, of speakers and experts. Uh, we also have a few tools that we'd like to uh, talk about. One, uh, as you probably have seen, this uh, meeting is, uh, is recorded. Um, we also have uh, simultaneous interpretation in French uh, and in Spanish, uh, and then we will be using the chat box uh, as an ongoing um, you know, collection tool for, uh, for Q&A, which uh, we uh, um, will structure in a very organized way. Um, the process of, of, oh, in addition, I, uh, I was told that we're also using a polling system uh, called Mentimeter. So you will see notices, please do respond uh, to the poll so we can follow um, the, um, uh, the flow of issues 
that you are uh, interested in. Um, uh, the main uh, challenges, or the main issues that we'll be covering uh, today, uh, uh, leveraging on what Manfred said, are essentially five key uh, areas. Uh, main challenges that the diaspora face while seeking resources uh, to you know, support their activities. Um, uh, identifying the key success factors in diaspora campaigns uh, or events. Uh, the role, the increasing role of digital tools to achieve those. Um, a few case studies uh, of success, uh, and then more importantly, uh, or equally important, uh, uh, building and sustaining uh, relationships with, uh, uh, with donors. Uh, uh, so we're using uh, a QR code for, this is really high tech, a QR code for uh, for the first set of questions. I'm gonna quickly spend some time on, on process. Uh, we have uh, uh, five uh, speakers uh, in, uh, in this panel uh, and the, the way the discussion is structured, uh, the speakers will take uh, three to five minutes to uh, talk about their area of, uh, of expertise in relation to those five key issues. Uh, and then subsequently, uh, we will have uh, respondents, uh, two respondents to uh, the comments made by the speakers. And then subsequently to that, I will moderate and field questions, clarifying questions to our, um, our panels. And then uh, subsequent to that, we will open up for, uh, uh, for questions. Um, the five uh, uh, speakers or panelists that we have today are uh, Mbimba uh, Jabi of the Africa Center, uh, Jorge Zafala uh, of the Global Network of Mexican Talents, uh, Lisa Gashi, uh, who's uh, uh, an executive leader, innovator, and entrepreneur, uh, Odile uh, Roberts, uh, deputy head of global programming uh, on uh, migration uh, at uh, SDC, and uh, last but not least, Evelyn Anyal, uh, program manager at uh, CADFP. Um, Without uh, uh, missing a beat, we'd like to start off with uh, Mbimba Jabi. Uh, the microphone is yours. You have, uh, you know, uh, let's say four minutes. Thank you very much, Manfred. Uh, thank you, the organizers, for putting this event together, uh, which is a very important topic uh, for the diaspora, especially looking at my, uh, maximizing diaspora engagement and mobilizing resources. Um, <clears throat> This is a topic very dear to, to myself as a diaspora development practitioner, but also a leader uh, in Ireland. That's, we are involved in a lot of uh, work <clears throat> with diaspora, but also in international development. I think diaspora engagement is very important to achieve the sustainable development goals, but also sustainable development in countries of origin. But most importantly, uh, <clears throat> diaspora, uh, I, we, I see as double funders to international development because we are taxpayers, but also we are also um, like send remittances as well, which, is, which contribute to a lot in terms of development of the countries of origin. When I mention diaspora, um, for me, I'm actually looking at it in a, in a more of a heritage, the first generation and second generation. For the first generation diaspora, which are born outside the, the countries that they are born in, uh, the historical context is something that is always uh, there and then it hinders the diaspora um, kind of work, uh, whether it's an individual or you are working in, in an organization because most of the people who actually came first as first generation diaspora, people tend to believe that they have limited education and then this also trickled down to even work in their organizations or whatever they do in terms of development. And I think this, uh, like these are the people who probably I engage more in, in international development now, starting from their cultural backgrounds and then establish NGOs and uh, working in, 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 in development, especially to look back to their countries. So this is the first thing that I think is a notion that affects uh, most diaspora organizers and leaders in terms of their fundraising, because the notion is that maybe they don't have a lot of skills set. And the diaspora organizations are seen as contacts as well. Mostly policymakers, government and funders 
uh, they tend to relate more to the diaspora in terms of getting contacts than actually engaging them into in, in development. And then we have seen uh, maybe sometime diaspora also are seen to be more practicing culture when it comes to like organizing other events than in, engaging them in, 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 um, in, in, in development. Um, but diaspora organizations do, do have skills and then they do have experiences from their own uh, training. And one thing people also sometimes uh, kind of forget about is that most of these diaspora leaders would have gone to universities with some of the, even the policymakers and uh, some of the donors. But these are some of the things that are actually hidden a bit. Uh, for the second generation or the subsequent generation of diaspora, they are totally different because these are the people who are actually engaged in more investment trade, skills transferred, but they are not really people who definitely send uh, remittances. And in terms of mobilization of resources, it's a very tricky bit. Uh, and I know a lot of discussions are going to be centered around that, but there is already a notion that most diaspora individuals and organizations have limited experience and to deliver development based on the already pre-existing notion of that the diaspora lack skills. And but you one have... thing we Sorry, you have one minute left. Okay, but one thing we need to actually look into is that also what, what has this diaspora ca has contributed? Like for example, uh, the Africa Center in Ireland, a good example is that in 2019, it has taken over six years in the country. Nobody has access development education funding in Ireland, but the Africa Center has. And then we coordinated activities in, in Ireland, Slovenia, and in Belfast which I think is some of the good practice that we can see in terms of diaspora contribution. But there's a lot of challenges, but I'm sure we'll get a lot of time to actually discuss that as well. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Mbimba. Uh, Jorge, uh, would you like to, um, uh, to take over? Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm glad to share all this, uh, the experience of being involved in the diaspora. It has been involved for the last uh, 18 years being a, a member of the diaspora living in the U.S. And the Mexican diaspora is a very spread out. Uh, we, we estimated that the knowledge economy people, we should be around a million and a half to a three million Mexicans living abroad. And that in some way is, is quite interesting because uh, from the point of view of resources, what is the most valuable resource that we can have when you have a three million people living abroad? is the knowledge, networking, and relationship that can be built. And we have been focused more than finding resource, financial resources, no, uh, finding ways in how to share knowledge and how to interchange programs. Currently, we have more than 65 chapters around the world, and we have been focusing how to create each chapter into most uh, self-contained and individual groups that are connected to, a net, to be a network of networks. That is one of the very interesting uh, approaches because each location has a different flavor, the reasons why the people has moved to uh, any locations. If you see the people that lives in, even in, within the United States that we have 52 consulates of Mexican consulates from the foraging affairs is each location has a completely different flavor and interest and points of view on the kind of people. In that sense, one of the points that we have been fostering is how we uh, work together, trying to, to get the linkage between the uh, locations in Mexico to locations anywhere and sharing experience. Currently, with the use of the technology after the pandemic, that has been one of the big ch changes that we have seen, is that we, we start to build a much more strong, uh, strongest communication channels is uh, several of the chapters has uh, starting to have their own broadcasting uh, uh, kind of uh, programs to share that kind of what is happening in uh, in Finland or what is happening in in Australia or what is happening in China and and share that with the uh, locations in complete different uh, areas in Mexico. Mexico is uh, 120 or 140 million people. Uh, that is a large country and the kind of connections that can be done is a, 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 a multidimensional because you can be talking about education, you can be talking about 
technology, you can be talking about sustainability. And, and that uh, builds a matrix. And that matrix is the kind of thing that we have been really enjoying uh, building in, in a different way. From that point, how we are uh, much more interested in generate the connections is, is the important part than how we can generate resources. Uh, the, the financial resources we know that are, are, are there and has been starting to flow in different ways, mainly from the United States to Mexico is a very large uh, amount of remesas that are sent to Mexico. But from all other parts of the world is, is been creating uh, a, a very uh, focused kind of activities right now, for instance, between Holland and Mexico through the local chapter in, in, in Nethertals. It's an amazing the amount of things that are happening around the food industry. When you are talking about uh, uh, arts and entertainment, uh, there are locations that are very focused into that level of, of activities. And in that sense, is we are very much uh, uh, interested in how to start triggering that uh, kind of connections. The, the previous activity that you say, how you build trust, the, the easy way to build trust is that you know you. And today with the capability of having interviews, have, I, I, I have been running a, a, a Facebook live program that I have been interviewing people from Mexico and connecting with people everywhere in the world. In the last year, I have more than 400 interviews. It's about uh, 600 uh, hours of time that is, uh, has been building that kind of, uh, uh, of, of uh, network in some way. Uh, okay, you have, uh, you have one minute. Yep. And, and in that sense, is really we are encouraging the people to take advantage of the technology. The, the, the cost of building these kind of things is an amazing, very low. Is uh, you really the, the most expensive part is the time of the people, and that time is one of the things that we're trying to how to grab a one hour of each person when you have a 3 million people, you have more than enough resources to be uh, uh, pursuing. That, that's the goal that we're seeking for that. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Jorge. Uh, Lisa, would you like to um, uh, take over? Thank you so much, Eric, for having me. Uh, good afternoon to everyone, or good morning in the other part of the world. As Eric mentioned, uh, my work relates to diaspora in terms of multiple venues. Uh, back in 2010, I began a journey as a student back then to try to stay connected with my home country through the venues of meeting fellow Albanians abroad to do something. And then we started something called uh, Kosovo Diaspora, where we started to just reconnect with other people and begin to share the stories, because the truth of the matter is that there, there are so many of us uh, in, across the world, but very, much, very little we know about who is who. So I think the biggest challenge of diaspora community is recognizing who is who among the community and who has access to uh, certain resources or certain skills. And I think identifying that for us was beginning with the journey of sharing, sharing the success story stories and more so on a level of what it means to be a migrant and what it means to be an integrated migrant and how what it means to to move from a journey of being an integrated migrant into giving back to the home country and I think in that aspect uh, there's been multiple ways we we found uh, challenges among the diaspora community I think one when it becomes the diaspora groups in different parts of the world they are scattered as as we all know and the problem becomes uh, there's a specific strategy for every every country where they reside, right? Uh, so first of all, a big group of diaspora community are unofficially, they're organized among themselves, but they don't have a legal or official status in the, in the country where they reside. Second, they tend to get connected mainly on national holidays uh, or the country's Independence Day or other cultural, uh, religious or uh, other uh, events that bring them together closer to, to their country of origin. And so they focus on, on, on those elements and often miss out on other ongoing events on the country of residence, right? The third part is that they're very uncoordinated in the big picture, although they are coordinated among their Towns. So, for example, we identified a town in, for example, Lausanne, a city in Switzerland, has, um, you know, on the national, uh, on the Kosovo's Independence Day or Albanian Independence Day, has some 30 events because uh, there are some 30 entities that each organize their own party for Independence Day. 
And uh, the question that became to me very important and relevant to them was, but how come you never got together to do something major? Because this uh, Independence Day is not just for us to celebrate it. It could be also an opportunity for Culture Point to share it with others, right? So they said, well, basically, we didn't know that we, there's 30 entities. There's like most, of, like most of us are unofficial. We just gather because we want to stay connected, but then not necessarily have the time and energy to really plug into official channels on making sure the paperwork is done, making sure you establish the legal entity and stuff like that. So that becomes uh, one of the sort of major challenges of getting that particular particular small group into a more organized and uh, a force that you could be, it could be a focal point. The other element is that a lot of groups are connected. Uh, they do fundraising, they do different events to connect to the whole to the, to the country of origin. But what happens is often in the country of origin, they lack partners. So that's when we be, begin to talk about, you know, there is a lot of resources, a lot of opportunities, and it's certainly governments on both ends of the migration cycle, be it at home or abroad, are trying to tap into this diaspora engagement component because they wanted to magnify this human capital of it, but also uh, financial resources. And what happened is that often there is a focal point abroad, but there might not be one at home. So who coordinates this effort? So that's when we went in 2014, we began an organization called Garmin, whose idea was basically to uh, to keep diaspora connected to home, there, there needs to be an, uh, there needs to be also entities at home that advocate for the social, political, and economical rights within the country of origin, as well as try to establish a two-way dialogue between the government at home and diaspora community abroad. What that means is really bringing the voices of diaspora community at the forefront of the policy level, in terms of addressing from the consular service, like Jorge was talking, to the specific needs of that particular community, but as well as raise awareness among uh, community that you're not alone. There is multiple groups in your town, in your city, in your in, your, in the country of residents that are working on different venues. And the third part, I think, which is something that is, you know, beginning to flourish now, it's more of a, the need for capacity building of diaspora communities abroad, the need for access to information more than the resources. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, like we've mapped out over 750 organizations that do work related to Albanian diaspora. Whether, okay. like, sorry, you have one minute left. Yeah, whether there is cultural, educational, or other um, areas uh, they've been doing work. So the idea now is how do we get these groups to really step up the game, either you know, remain an unofficial group if that's what they choose, but provide tools of what it means to be an you know uh, unregistered entity in Switzerland or Germany or any other country. But for us, Switzerland and Germany are the two main targets of Kosovo and then Italy and Greece are, are for, for Albania. Well, we also have a one large diaspora we call an Albanian diaspora, but they have multiple countries uh, in terms of the country of origin, right? So they're spread across the Balkans, like Kosovo, Montenegro, Macedonia, uh, Albania. And so that's also the other part is how do you keep this group tied under that um, Part, but ensure that governments at home and also entities at home collaborate. And then in that aspect, I think uh, that needs to be a lot done in terms of capacity building, but also moving the initiatives beyond individuals. Like, how do we ensure that diaspora groups don't die because one individual pass on gets tired of the work they've done with diaspora? And how do we ensure that institutional memory, which I think is the biggest threat when it comes to diaspora engagement? Great, wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa. Uh, Odile? Thank you very much, um, and uh, good afternoon to, to everyone, and thank you for having uh, me uh, together with you this afternoon. Uh, it's quite uh, inspiring to hear you. Um, I work for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Switzerland, and uh, the Swiss Agency for Development Cooperation, which is uh, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the unit I work for is called the Global Programme of Migration and Development, and we were created in 2008. So we have kind of 10 years of experience on um, working with diaspora because since the beginning we started to work on, on diaspora as part of our... Did we lose her? 
I think we lost the deal. Sorry, can you hear oh, me? Yep, there you go. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, I work in this unit called uh, GPMD, the Global Program on Migration and Development, which was created in 2008. And as the, as the first step, we obviously decided to work with diaspora in our effort to work on migration and development. And we have gathered quite a few experiences in the past 10 years, um, which we use now to really improve our partnership. We have used successful and less successful experiences. And, and that's where we are um, now. Um, maybe at the outset, let me say that, that Switzerland uh, work or at maximizing the positive effect of migration and minimizing the negative one in order to reach the, the SDGs. We believe that migrants and diaspora play a crucial role in development uh, work. And that we are convinced that it is only with policy coherence that um, that policy coherence will only be ensured if all stakeholders are included in the debate. And that's why we advocate very much for an inclusive participative policy dialogue that includes not only the national, but also the regional and the local governments, but also civil society and migrants and private sector. So we ensure that the voice of migrants feed into the migration and development policies. Uh, and that's why we engage very closely with um, diaspora. Uh, we work on, we call it the three E approach, basically enabling environments, so creating appropriate framework condition in countries of origin, transit and destination to harvest the economic and human capital of migrants, um, enhancing the capacities of diaspora to design and carry out development initiative and engaging diaspora, as I was saying, at the policy level so that they participate to the global debate on migration and development. In terms of, um, of experiences uh, and, and challenges, we have had quite a, a lot of, of um, challenges in the past uh, 10 years, but also success. And uh, because of some of the challenges, Lisa alluded to some of them uh, before, like the lack of structured and institutional partners, you know, as a donor, you want to have institutionalized partner. And, and sometimes you, you are in the difficulty to find uh, a sustainable long-term partner. That's what we are requested to do, right? Um, or, or we have some, some experiences also with, with divergent politicized, political, religious, ethnic conflict among the diaspora or the representation issues has also been raised by different organizations organization, you know, Switzerland as a donor, we work with this organization, but actually it's politicized and all that. So, so there's quite a lot of issue with we have to be careful. Currently, we are very much engaged with platforms, um, for example, with ADAPT, uh, which is a, a African Europe a diaspora development platform. And thanks for the invitation as well. And, and we find in ADAPT a partner with the capacity and the capability to convene diverse diaspora development actors in a very professional manner. And, and that's why we are very keen on, on working with platform at the moment. Um, I just wanted to make a few remarks on some specific topic mm -hmm. uh, that are quite um, important at the moment. The first one is crowdfunding effort. To, to raise um, uh, additional uh, funding mechanism, let's say. And, and it's very interesting and it has a lot of potential. So that's why we, we now uh, support effort to support the capacity building of diaspora in how to access crowdfunding. And we also support MPI, the Migration uh, Policy Institute, in a research on crowdfunding and resource mobilization facilities. So I believe that quite important interesting and complementary to the work of the donor of our work as a state you know because as a state um we 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 are engaged more on the framework condition as i was saying or on sustainability and effectiveness and then crowdfunding is really a mechanism that can uh, complement this then i wanted to make a remark on on digitalization and remittances because um one minute to go please yeah, but I hope you let me um, come with that point, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so digitalization and remittances is quite fancy, but it's quite very interesting because the potential of remittances is clearly not uh, being realized at the moment, right? And and uh, we are engaging into that because, bon, you know, the obstacle, the high transfer cost, the, the informal transfer, but also the fact that migrants 
and the families are very much underserved in terms of tailor-made finance product on the market, you know, in terms of saving credit, pension, insurance, they don't have access or what they access is not responding to their need. So basically, we, we, we work on enhancing the financial inclusion on, of migrants and, and, and their uh, families. Um, uh, because we believe that that this will have an impact uh, on on sustainable development, and and here it's important to say that digital solution alone will not bring the desired changes without supporting measure, because if you don't have the regulatory and policy environment that promotes this digital uh, a solution, and if you don't have the financial literacy and awareness either no matter how innovative and interesting the, 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 the innovation is, the, this will not work because you need to have the framework condition. So that's, that's quite very important. And let me just conclude with COVID-19, right? Because the impact of COVID-19 has been quite relevant in the work of the diaspora. First, because we saw that the work of diaspora has an impact in amplifying the effect of national and local COVID responses and recovery efforts, Trends, thanks to this transnational engagement effort of the diaspora. And this has been seen in many countries last year, but I think it's very important. And the second point is because of the mobility restriction, we have seen a lot of problems in terms of these informal um, remittances and all that. And that's where we should support more this digital platform and technology because that's where we can ensure the continuous engagement of the diaspora with the, with the, with the countries of origin. So I think this is really COVID-19 highlighted that. And I will stop here because otherwise you'll cut me, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Adil. Thank you. Um, uh, Evelyn, uh, could you please? Thank you very much, uh, Eric. Um, I, I, I seem to be the one who is speaking from the continent. Yes, I coordinate a diaspora um, scholars program called the Carnegie African Diaspora Fellowship Program, working with the diaspora scholars, the African born diaspora scholars based in the US and Canada. And they come back to six, nine African countries, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Ghana, Nigeria, South Africa, and now Ethiopia, Rwanda, and Senegal for a period of between three weeks to three months to support universities on um, research, curriculum development, and graduate uh, students teaching and mentorship. And this has, uh, um, has created a lot of impact at, 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 at the universities in, this, uh, in, the, in the nine countries. And this is in, in recognition of the uh, highly skilled um, uh, uh, diaspora scholars with the knowledge and, and, and experience that is important for, for Africa's uh, uh, both social and, and economic development. And so um, uh, having uh, worked with this program for the last uh, five years now, uh, some of the issues are coming into play which have also been raised here are very important issues. Uh, issues to do with the institutionalization. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's important to have diaspora programs uh, well institutionalized in, you know, in, in the country where they are being implemented. And uh, for us, uh, the, 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 the universities that host the diaspora scholars provide a good institution for collaboration between diasporas in the, in, in the US and Canada. And, and the ones in Africa. And just by way of, of, you know, of information, having um, realized the impact that this program has created in these uh, nine African countries, we have moved forward and registered the Consortium of African Diaspora Scholars programs that will give an opportunity to all African uh, diaspora scholars in the whole world coming back to work in the whole of Africa, not only uh, uh, African born in the US and Canada coming to only nine African countries, but working with the diaspora scholars across the globe to come back to, you know, to, 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 to the whole continent. So uh, institution, institutions are important because again, as be, has been alluded by, I think, it was Odil or, or Lisa uh, very well that uh, uh, donors like to work with, uh, with institutions, not 
worked with the individuals because institutions also provide a uh, um, possibility for sustainability. The other issue is involving uh, the governments in, in the work of the diaspora. The government provides a policy framework, policy uh, um, environment uh, that are important for uh, success of diaspora work, looking at issues of taxation, issues of uh, immigration laws, enabling uh, diaspora to, to, to have um, supportive working uh, environments. The other issue that um, has also been raised here, uh, which uh, we have also uh, come across in, in our work includes um, having diaspora voices in, 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 in policy issues involving diaspora and, and giving them a, plot, a platform where they can also contribute to the policy framework that can uh, uh, lead to successful diaspora uh, work. Um, of course, digitalization, uh, 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 you know, which uh, currently, because most of uh, um, our fellows were not able to travel to their host universities, they are, many of them started their work online. Their, their, their research work, uh, you know, some student teaching, which have started online, of course, culminating later on into face-to-face -face, uh, uh, um, collaboration when the situation uh, uh, improves. Um, the issue of, uh, you know, uh, what the other issue that was con uh, raised here, um, and different strategies. Uh, yeah, then there was the issue of lack of partners, which again, as, as I say, that is important. Diasporas uh, should have partners in, uh, in, in their countries of origin or in the countries where they would want to go and work. And this is because of uh, information, they need information that would uh, help them uh, succeed in their work. And so again, uh, connection with not only um, the hosting institutions, but regional institutions. For example, uh, we work with, uh, in East Africa, we work with the Inter-University Council for East Africa. We also work with the Association of African Universities. Uh, which gives um, anchors uh, our work and also the need to uh, tap into ongoing uh, frameworks, ongoing uh, processes in the continent and finding a niche on, 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 uh, um, on um, supporting what is going on with the skills and the knowledge and the experience and the networks uh, that these diaspora scholars provide. I think I will stop there for now. Yeah, thank you. Hello. Um, great, wonderful. Um, I think uh, we have had the, uh, the unbelievable pleasure of listening to diverse, uh, very deep uh, you know, experiences uh, coming from uh, a panel steep in the, uh, in the issue. Um, uh, the process, uh, uh, asks me uh, to remind uh, the uh, audience uh, to use the chat box uh, to ask uh, uh, questions uh, and also please respond to uh, the, the uh, polling tool uh, as well. Um, uh, questions uh, so far, uh, people of the 50 uh, who uh, have joined us, uh, we have uh, California, Budapest, Ireland, Kosovo, uh, Qatar, uh, Berlin, and uh, Delhi, quite uh, a geographical spread. Um, very, very good at this issue being very, very important. Um, uh, question two, do you have, uh, be able to share that? Ah, and then this is sort of a, a poll on what kind of organization uh, you are a member of. ranging from diaspora uh, organizations to government organizations to NGOs to the private sector to philanthropy. And the, and the answer is, or the spread of answers are, oh, no, no responses so far for number two. Okay, great. Um, what we'll do now is uh, we will uh, uh, go to the uh, respondents uh, who will go first? Uh, 
uh, we have two respondents, Odile and, uh, and Everlyn. Um, I would like to ask uh, Odile uh, to do the uh, first um, responding uh, uh, comment, please. Ah, uh, just quickly here on the uh, polling, I uh, just got that, but uh, we can come back to the polling later. So, uh, Odile? Um, thank you. Um, I have I have actually um, made most of, of of the point earlier um, that I uh, that I wanted to 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 make, and and uh, I think uh, most of the the, the comments uh, done by by the different interlocutor also uh, are linked to that. Um, maybe one thing that I wanted to 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 put for the discussion um, now is uh, also in view of the organizer of the meeting and all that, is uh, where do we stand on um, the topic of the meeting, basically uh, resource mobilization? Um, how many, because there's a lot of mapping of diaspora and things like that being out there or being currently done and all that. But, but when we map the diaspora, do we map the resources as well? You know, do we map who does what, who access to what kind of funding, which donor do what, which donor partner with which kind of organization. And not only the traditional donor being the development agencies, but also let's say, you know, the, the private sector or some uh, foundation because they work a lot also with diaspora and all that. So, so I would really, if we could have a, a discussion on that, and I know that uh, IOM through the diaspora and others also uh, today uh, are there. And, and I think I would be interested to know what is out there in terms of research and, and what are the plans in terms of, of, of this mapping of, um, of, of resources. And then another um, point I, I would like to make, and, and I fully understand uh, what was mentioned on, on the challenges and, uh, and how to go about it. And I think it's a learning process for all of us being the diaspora organization, small, big platforms, uh, actors of the private sector, individuals, you know, but, but really like, um, you know, in this learning process, where, where do we see the, the, the future of our cooperation in, in the next future? What are the main topics, let's say, for the next two, three years that we should really explore? to improve our different partnerships, you know? So, so I mentioned crowdfunding because it was also mentioned in, 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 the, in, the, in the concept note of the event. And actually I found very little of that, you know? So, so, so and, and what are successful experiences, less successful experiences and others. So I think that would be very interesting if we could also discuss what, what are the main trends, you know, in terms of wh where are we going? Because digitalization is nice and fancy and everything but what do we mean by that right what did we achieve is there some good practices that we can report on 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 the remittances but also on 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 having more um uh, diaspora voices heard in the different processes or things like that um that would be the second point i would like i would like to to raise for the discussion if if that works for you eric Wonderful, thank you. Um, I will uh, comment and then put this back to uh, uh, the key uh, panelists, but I'd like to hear from uh, Everlyn first and then we can come back and, and moderate uh, the, the discussion. Uh, Everlyn, uh, responding. Thank you very much again. Uh, and uh, I think one thing that we need to recognize is generally there is a diminishing you know funding level across all sectors and so um what what are some of the strategies that uh, diaspora uh, activities can use to um prolong the available funding because most donors uh, sometimes are catalysts they fund an idea and uh, it's, it's, it's supposed to catalyze other ideas and bring together other donors on board. And so we also need to think about um, uh, the, the, the donors, small donors, especially African donors, and how they can support what uh, other donors have put on the table. 
I'm thinking about um, the African Union and the African governments and having recognized the diaspora as their sixth region. And what can they put on the table to, um, to support what other donors have already provided? So for me, it's funding is running down and what are the strategies that we need to put into place in terms of cost sharing. For example, the, um, our diaspora scholars, the program is funded by the Carnegie Corporation of New York, but the hosting institution um, are, 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 are encouraged to, to provide uh, support in terms of uh, housing, in terms of local transportation, so that they also own the, the process. So these are some of the issues that we need to think about uh, on, on, on co-sponsoring, co on what we can put on the table as we seek uh, 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 funding from, from other donors, our governments, governments not only providing financial support, but enabling environments. Our governments can also help um, in convening uh, uh, round tables for, for other donors, local donors to supplement what uh, 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 international donors uh, uh, provide. So for me, my thoughts are about that, of course, issues of, of local institutionalization and developing a well-structured system of, of, of working with the diaspora. Now I can say that uh, having worked in this program for five years, we have a, a well-structured system to mobilize diaspora, to connect them with universities, you know, to report, to, to, to monitor and evaluate this. And some of the information that we already have can help in terms of decision making uh, uh, on, on diaspora engagement in, 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 in the education sector. Yes, and this is, the, as, as, as I said earlier on, this is also pegging into the, the Continental Education Strategy for Africa 20, uh, 2016, 2025. So again, finding how diaspora work can support the already uh, um, laid down uh, frameworks so that uh, you know, we put, we, we put uh, processes that can, can, can lead to something tangible and sustainable. Wonderful, thank you, Evelyn. I, um, uh, I'd like to sort of try to uh, encapsulate the, the issues. I mean, they're, they're um, very broad, uh, in some case, very complex because of COVID, uh, you know, pre-COVID versus post-COVID. Um, you know, issues of mobilization of, of the diaspora themselves, or, you know, uh, legal, regulatory uh, issues. And then, as Evelyn uh, just said, you know, in that context, you have dwindling, uh, you know, institutional financial support, right? Uh, you have fiscal tightness at the state level in the host countries because of, you know, you know before COVID, you had the financial uh, crisis, so a, a lot of uh, spending there and very, very little uh, space to do, you know, diaspora support in terms of financial, you know, in terms of financial uh, means. And so the question remains, you know, in that very difficult context, uh, you know, how do you, uh, first of all, identify uh, potential sources of uh, resource mo uh, mobilization? Uh, but more importantly, how do you then sustain uh, that in, in that context? Um, one issue that came up was, you know, the use of uh, crowdfunding, although, uh, you know, the idea of uh, the experience around crowdfunding is not widespread, although there are some very good success um, uh, stories. Um, but then you also have, you know, a massive amount of uh, remittances, the case of Mexico, you know, hitting 40 you know, billion dollars uh, run rate, a record, um, you know, so far. Uh, puzzling, uh, you know, you know policymakers, is that leverageable? And if so, how? Um, uh, uh, Odile raised the very important uh, point of, uh, you know, spending a lot of time on uh, mapping of the diaspora, which I think is very important, particularly if you're looking at the case of Albania, where you know, making sure that you can connect all the disparate members of the, of the diaspora, particularly in, in a, a small diaspora situation. Uh, but, but more importantly, shouldn't we be mapping uh, the, uh, the resources, uh, so mapping uh, uh, you know, donors, uh, so a donor mapping exercise, so at least that kind of intelligence can be used uh, in, in order to understand 
which donor is doing what, which donor is a, is a catalyst, which donor is a policy supporter, which donor does whatever. And I think that as a tool, you know, could be very uh, interesting, particularly for I diaspora, you know, to look at contributing that. I'd like to uh, pivot and take advantage of uh, uh, two members of the audience who uh, could bring a wealth of uh, uh, insight uh, into this discussion. I'd like to start uh, first with uh, Ms. Anna Farrow, who's a diaspora expert and specifically an expert in fundraising and grant making. Anna, do you care to uh, make a, a few comments, uh, three to four minutes? Is she muted? Uh, I think you're muted. Ah, there you go. Hello, um, so this is Anna from Italy, and thanks for giving me the chance to participate in this um, very important event. And just to, to add a little um, contribution to the other uh, participants' uh, voices, because I'm not the this is not the voice from diaspora, so I'm a diaspora expert uh, bringing up the voices of other diaspora groups. And uh, especially in terms of uh, fundraising, I think it's very important to point out uh, um, the different contribution from individuals and uh, groups, diaspora groups uh, and members, and especially uh, distinguish between also informal groups uh, and uh, formal networks uh, that are still um, widespread and widespread uh, today, especially in, uh, in Europe. And fundraising um, capacities also um, can find support in uh, new technologies. For instance, uh, uh, I know of an um, informal group from Burkina Faso uh, that is connecting uh, diaspora spread around from uh, Libya Algeria and Europe and USA, and they use uh, uh, WhatsApp groups uh, to raise up uh, um, money to support uh, their projects, uh, agricultural projects led in the, uh, in the village of origin. And also, um, as far as my experience also is concerned, uh, fundraising activities also could be supported with capacity building uh, uh, support from other civic society organizations in um, reinforcing existing uh, skills, but also working more on communication skills, also to enlarge the uh, fundraising group, not only migrants, but could be also other citizens that could be interested to support uh, projects from the diaspora. So I think I might stop here also to give the voice to other persons, thanks a lot. Great, thank you very much for that, uh, uh, Anna. I, I think, uh, uh, sort of to, to comment on Anna's contribution, uh, the use of WhatsApp groups, uh, if, you know, Facebook um, and a few other, you know, similar platforms where small amounts of money can be you know, raised from, uh, uh, from various individuals who form these informal groups is a very powerful tool. And we're seeing more and more uh, examples of that. Another tool which we've seen here uh, in the case of uh, the Ethiopian Diaspora Trust Fund, uh, an example which I, I'd like to come back to during the, the discussion, where they've been able to raise in excess of $10 million uh, using an online platform around issues that, uh, in a very democratic way, uh, that the members uh, of, uh, uh, you know, of the, uh, uh, the Ethiopian Diaspora uh, care about and contribute to. Uh, and these are small amounts uh, aggregated in a very transparent way that are meant to fund uh, socioeconomic projects, uh, you know, in uh, in Ethiopia. Um, I'd like to call upon Professor Binod, uh, who is a diaspora engagement scholar, uh, to also make comments uh, on on this issue. Uh, professor, hi, hi. It's great to uh, listen to the 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 presentations and also the intervention that has been <clears throat> just uh, shared with us. Uh, well, I think in terms of the funding uh, challenges with reference to the diaspora, I tend to think in terms of diaspora philanthropy, you know, and that diaspora philanthropy can be 
thought in terms of various sectors, uh, in terms of health-related philanthropy directly by the organizations which are professional diaspora organizations, homeland, uh, you know, uh, diaspora organizations like uh, American associations of physicians of Indian origin, who themselves not only fund, but also implement the projects in uh, various parts of the world and specifically in two states of India, Andhra Pradesh and Bihar. Uh, then I also tend to think that the other large group of diaspora philanthropy is the religious uh, field in terms of various groups, whether it is uh, the Hindu diaspora or the, the Christian diaspora or the Sikh diaspora. So, and, and there are many more. So that has different agendas and that is that kind of fundraising is not only in terms of money, but also in terms of kind and services, material and services. And we have seen that happening in the COVID context uh, to a great extent where food was uh, in short supply, where people were starving because of uh, challenges of livelihood and so on. And that's where direct contribution of the diet diaspora groups in terms of providing, you know, ready to eat food in millions of, 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 uh, of plates, so to say, packages uh, across the world. Uh, those are, I think, some landmark uh, developments that we need to understand and take note of. And similarly, we find that particularly geared towards migrants uh, in terms of rehabilitating them, in terms of uh, trying to uh, figure out what kind of living conditions and so on that they are facing, whether that those can be improved. So there have been these initiatives and I think we need to take a very holistic view in terms of uh, you know, the contribution of the diasporas, both in terms of cash and kind. Mm -hmm. Thank no, you. Ex excellent, thank you for that, uh, uh, Professor Binod. Um, I, I, I think that that's, a, that's an excellent point. Uh, uh, from personal experience, uh, the churches, uh, particularly in, uh, in East and Southern Africa, uh, have been extremely powerful in terms of mobilizing, as uh, uh, Professor Bernard said, both resources as well as expertise and uh, and services. And particularly, you know, we see that during uh, periods of crises, just like uh, you know the one uh, just like just like uh, uh, COVID. So philanthropy is very very powerful. The example of the Ethiopian uh, diaspora trust fund is one of the you know more organized ones and public ones that I've seen. Uh, we can go into detail of, of how they, they set themselves up, but in the U.S., they set themselves up as a formal uh, philanthropy, uh, what we call a 501c3, uh, with a, uh, an organization in uh, Ethiopia that is overseeing the projects and implementation. Uh, um, and then among the members uh, is a partner from PwC, so there's formal auditing of the books and sharing of that audit on the, on the platform so that you instill trust through, through transparency. I saw that trust was an issue that came up in the, uh, uh, in the chat box. Um, what I'd like to do now is, is uh, uh, sort of uh, field a few questions across uh, both the panels, uh, uh, the panelists, uh, as well as the, uh, as the respondent and you know, a, a kind uh, uh, contribution from Anna and Professor Binod as well. Um, it, it seems like we, we're talking about two major tracks. On the one hand, uh, we are impressed by uh, remittances uh, and the fact that remittances are not only meant uh, to support families, um, uh, you know, they are, uh, according to Dilip Ratha's research at the World Bank, they're counter cyclical, so they're, they're even much more robust than foreign direct investment and in periods of crises, they tend to increase. Um, but yet, on the other hand, you know, we're talking about uh, diaspora organizations that are doing, you know, policy advocacy, skills development, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, government uh, uh, engagement, both at home and in the host country, uh, are we missing a link between remittances and the expansion of the activities of these organizations who are obviously uh, uh, are working in the best interest of both uh, migrants and uh, uh, professional diaspora, as well as, as the interest of, of those back home? 
uh, any any comments uh, on on that? Um, I'd like to go to Mbimba. Mbimba, any uh, any comments on that from your perspective? Yeah, thanks, Eric, for for that. Um, yeah, there's um, uh, there there are initiatives actually uh, happening. I'll give an example. Um, I was in the Gambia from January to March this year, and then based on my personal experience working with the uh, the African Institute for Remittances, which is based in Nairobi, to actually look into leveraging remittances for SME development. Um, so we actually went to the Central Bank of the Gambia because like last year, even though the COVID happened, but the Gambia actually is, is, has experienced nearly uh, for 40% of the GDP actually coming from remittances to the country. So we are actually looking into how can we work with the central bank. First of all, it's more of data collection, but there's a lot of Gambians out there who would definitely invest their remittances because they are actually sending to their family members because they had bad experiences of investing in business, taken over by friends or family members. So we actually are looking into how can we encourage these people to start investing in businesses. So this is something that we are working on. And then it's, it's something that I, I think is doable um, as well in, in some of the country, because first of all, the Gambia is experiencing over 60% of unemployment, especially in the youth. And then most of those young people are the ones that are actually going to the Mediterranean Sea to reach Europe. So these are, these are some of the things that we are actually putting into consideration to see how we can get these people established business. The Africa Center, is going to be an intermediary between the diaspora and the people who might have ideas. So instead of giving money to their family members, what we are planning to do is that we would, we would actually work with the people who have business ideas, but they don't have finances. Get a business plan and get the diaspora to invest in them. And then also vice versa. Diaspora would have an interest. They have uh, money, but they don't know how to go about the business. So this is a model that we are trying to do in the Gambia at the moment. Understood. So what Mbemba is, is, uh, is talking about is where the uh, diaspora organization is uh, uh, trying to solve, uh, you know, the agency problem that the diaspora has when it remits uh, money back home, particularly uh, uh, the percentage of the remittances that is deemed to be uh, investable money. And the World Bank uh, and a few others deem that percentage to be somewhere between 15 and 25%. Of, of global remittances, which is a significant amount of money. Uh, and so addressing the gap between uh, SME, yeah. finance, employment, youth engagement, uh, and uh, uh, the portion of remittances that is sent back home uh, for investment purposes is, uh, you know, is, uh, is a solution. Uh, you know, in terms of our experience at, at Homestrings, uh, we use crowdfunding uh, to do that. One of the biggest impediments uh, that we had to, to face uh, was the regulatory environment uh, yeah. in the host country uh, uh, because as you're dealing with investments, you're dealing with securities laws and securities laws can be quite stringent when it comes to uh, regulatory compliance. Uh, so, you know, we've tried to address that in the U.S. Um, and, uh, and in the U.K. But, but the, the issue I'd like to come back to is, is the, the sourcing uh, mobilization of funding for uh, diaspora engagement. Uh, diaspora investment is related, but not necessarily the, yeah. core, uh, the core issue. I'd like to call on uh, Dr. Salome Mbua, uh, Mbugua, uh, who apparently is in the audience and uh, made a few comments related to this issue. Uh, Dr. Mbugua, is your uh, microphone uh, muted? Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, and I was just actually talking there about the diaspora organization. Um, my organization was able to enable and empower. We actually try to look more into the resources which are already in the countries. We are working in the 
Republic of Congo and in Kenya. And it's really identifying people on the ground on what resources are already available and then trying to match them from diaspora perspective. But I think it will be very important uh, going back to the point that was raised on um, uh, trying to actually have a diaspora philanthropy or diaspora collecting money and, and even looking into how the, 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 the state or the government can be able to match that kind of uh, money. It will be very important that we work in partnership with our government because even if we try and go do as much as we want to do, it will be very, very difficult to meet all the demands and all the, the, the needs on the ground. Just to say that based on our work and what you have seen on the ground, there are so many resources within the continent itself. For example, it's not only resources of money, but also, you know, people have big farms and agricultural farms that they can use, you know, if well resourced. Another means that can also be brought forward to be able to uh, support people. We really need to think on how to create jobs, especially for, uh, because of the youth that we know and we are hearing that uh, the African continent will have the, the largest population of the youth in the next coming few years. So we really have to be prepared for this because if it's a youth that doesn't have jobs, it will be very problematic. So I would just that, you know, we try to go towards, you know, soliciting for funding, funding and looking for this funding and not really much more depending on donors because, for example, Africa has also been destroyed by the dependency model of the charitable model rather than actually the, that empowerment model or enabling model to try and look into how we can have resources that comes from the people and the diaspora if they actually contribute even a euro each. That's quite a lot of money at the very end. It's really how do we organize this and then working with the state to be able to uh, match this kind of contribution in supporting the activities and, and the work on the ground. But there's so much that can be done on the ground. There's quite a lot of resources that are already existing within the own, within, within for example, our own continent itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, I mean, the, the, the key points there are, one, resources that exist within the continent itself, set aside, you know, how you can leverage remittances. Um, and then the second point was, again, joining the comment uh, that uh, Professor Binod made about, uh, you know, philanthropy, uh, the, the use of philanthropy. But this is diaspora philanthropy, right, where the, those who are sending money understand the problem and may even have, you know, the skills to contribute to solving uh, that problem, as in the case of the uh, the uh, uh, American Association of Indian Physicians, uh, uh, giving a, a good example. I'd like to uh, get a comment from Jorge. Uh, uh, you know, the, the diaspora is, is relatively large, relatively concentrated in the U.S. And as I mentioned, you know, remittances are very significant. Uh, uh, the, dias the diaspora in the, the, the U.S. is fairly sophisticated in terms of you know financial instruments. So the issue of financial inclusion isn't necessarily a, a major issue when it comes to the diaspora. Um, how does your network uh, fund itself uh, and its activities? Do you, you get a comment on that, please? Yeah, that, that, that's one of the very interesting points is uh, usually all the, the activities that are developed by the Mexican chapters, if you like to say uh, as a name, is done by the same people within the chapter in a, in a way that we self-support it. But now uh, I, I really, the, the point here is uh, one of the things that we, I agree very much in the point that was mentioned before about them, we need to focus on how to not to, to get money to spend. We, uh, the, 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 the remittance is more a, a way to survive, uh, survival money in some way. And we, we are looking very much in how to build uh, well creation capabilities with the support of the, of the, uh, uh, foreign people, the diaspora people. And that is the, the, the focus is how we teach people to build these business plans, business models, because um, uh, that, that was, I, I was involved in a very large project uh, from the government of Mexico in how to build the, the, the companies of the future of Mexico. And giving the money was not really the best help. It, it helps by all means. But the, the most important thing was, was how to change the mindset, how to change the way of using resources, how to, to find the good problems to be uh, 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 developed and that problems when they were uh, supported or sol uh, solved, how that generates wealth. And that wealth is start to increase into a synergy approach than say good things that are invested in creating a new, uh, very, uh, a profitable 
uh, solutions, that solutions uh, and generate resources to keep going into the next problem to be solved. And that is one of the, the important things. I, I agree is the, the Mexican diaspora, that th is changing a, a, a quite a bit because in the <laughs> last uh, five years in some way has gone a lot of people, not to the United States, going into Europe is a huge amount of people going to Europe, going to Asia, going to uh, Australia and uh, Oceania area. That, that's amazing how the distribution now is, uh, is still being in the US, but is moving into other places uh, as well. And, and but the, the main goal here is how we created new models. Uh, in one side, one of the things I am fostering, for instance, is, is a guy that is looking how to provide a small investments for persons in, in, the, in the schools, in high schools, for instance, and learn how to use to improve the school. That is a, a very interesting approach. Can you imagine giving a thousand dollars to a high school pe a group of people and say how you invest that amount of money as a student without the decision of the school in how to improve the school and say, well, $1,000 is not very much money or can be a lot of money, depends where you are. And one of the things these guys say, I want to do that in a hundred million people giving a thousand dollars. And that is a, some concept of crowdsourcing or crowdfunding in some way, but it's with a complete different than you set the goal, what you want to achieve before. And that kind of leadership can really generate a very strong trend because when you start having people doing the same, uh, focusing to the same results, doing different things, at the end, uh, the expectation is that you are going to be seeing a lot of very small results than when you add it is going to be a big change locally mm -hmm. or in, in any place. Mm -hmm. This is quite, uh, thanks, uh, Jorge. That, that's, uh, that's extremely uh, insightful. You're raising uh, a couple of issues. So one is, um, the themes uh, and the issues that the diaspora organizations are focusing on may not necessarily be the issues and the themes that the diaspora would like uh, to focus on. I mean, th this issue of focusing on wealth building uh, can attract a lot of attention from the diaspora. And I can see where, uh, to the extent that those tools are credible tools and they can be transformative, they would want to support organizations or an organization that actually is providing those kinds of tools. And that sort of links a little bit to, um, you know, the program that Mbemba is doing in Sierra Leone, which is trying to find ways of connecting the diaspora with investments uh, back home through the credibility of the, uh, of the central bank. The, the other issue um, is uh, innovation, right, around experimenting with new models, experimenting with new solutions, uh, particularly focus on incentives as opposed to money. Uh, mm -hmm. and aligning the incentives with the uh, expected results and propagating those, uh, those solutions. Um, one of the elements that I'd like to bring up related to that uh, uh, is with uh, Everlyn. Everlyn, the very essence of the model that you have, which is, uh, I guess, in, in a few uh, recognizable terms, is reverse brain drain, um, raises the question as to whether um, you know, the, uh, the expertise that you're bringing back home uh, is uh, restrained or constrained within the academic field. Do you envision uh, a scenario in which that expertise can be unleashed uh, to address the issues that we just, uh, we just talked about? Uh, financial inclusion, um, uh, creating new uh, models of development and funding of development uh, coming from uh, this expertise that is being facilitated back to the continent. Thank you. Yes, uh, currently we might um, look at the expertise as, uh, you know, only domiciled within the academic field, but also recognizing the fact that um, universities need to produce um, uh, scholars and, and you know and uh, graduates who have the necessary skills for the needs of society for the needs of the workplace and so 
it starts right from there that uh, many of the graduates from our, our institutions of higher learning lack the necessary skills that uh, the, the workplace uh, uh, require, that the society requires, including lack of innovation, innovation uh, initiatives and, uh, and, um, and um, always looking at um, job employment as opposed to creativity and all that. And so it, it, it might be that, yes, we are focusing on, 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 on a higher education, but because higher education produces uh, those uh, the, the work the, the the workmen and the workwomen into the society. Uh, other than that, we also the issue of research. Uh, Africa, there is a lot. There is there is very uh, minimal research coming out of Africa, and so it means that uh, we cannot do research into other areas that can feed into helping us development, develop uh, our, our, our societies. So issues of, of research, research capacities, um, uh, uh, issues of, of curriculums, you know, curriculums that have been used for many, many, many years that don't resonate with what is, is, is relevant for, for society today. So um, it, uh, it, 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 and th there is also the element of collaboration of uh, many institutions, non-academic uh, mm. institutions collaborating with academic institutions. Academic institutions need to get out and collaborate with the, with the, with the private sector because um, they help the private sector to develop uh, goods and, and services that are, 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 are of, um, of relevance to the to the communities and to the societies, so um, it, it's 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 um, it's a fact that yes, our work is is currently within the uh, academic institutions, but we also encourage a lot of collaboration with the with the, with the institutions of of research, health institutions, and other institutions uh, that serve uh, general community, the, the the society and the community. And, uh, and, and, and so I think um, one issue that we also need to uh, uh, appreciate is the, um, the lack of skills in Africa that has contributed to, uh, for example, Africa contributes 2% uh, you know, of knowledge to the, to the entire world. That is unacceptable. And we are in the, in the fourth industrial estate and uh, the fourth industrial yeah, uh, 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 when, um, Societies must uh, develop through uh, knowledge production, through research, you know, through innovation. So, for me, there is complementarity between what we do and what goes on in the in the society. Understood. One, we need each other. Both, both, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Understood. Yeah, I, I, I think the and, and those are excellent, uh, um, excellent points. Um, you know, the issue of, so you have an amazing platform, uh, right? So you have institutionalized reverse brain, brain drain. Uh, and as a result, not only, you know, to use the words of uh, Professor you know, Binod, you, you've been able to capture uh, services and skills, uh, but then there's the other piece, how can you uh, use that more dynamically to uh, innovate in terms of solutions, right? Innovate in terms of identifying key uh, incentives that could uh, resolve uh, youth unemployment, uh, that could resolve uh, 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 intellectual property creation. Uh, the universities in the U.S. are the hotbed of uh, incubation uh, of innovation. Given you know the concentration of knowledge that you've been able to bring back on an African platform, would it not be um, uh, critical to facilitate? Um, the incubation of innovation with these brains that are coming with very broad experiences, whether it's innovation in healthcare, innovation entrepreneurship, innovation uh, in the uh, you know in the sciences, uh, and then there I can see in the context of new themes and new DAS organizations being able to mobilize uh, you know uh, resources among their members to support that kind of uh, that kind of initiative. Um, I'd like to go to Lisa. Um, the Albanian diaspora is, is a very, very difficult uh, job, uh, as, as you put it. It's, it's, it's small, it's uh, dispersed, uh, it lacks institutionalization. Uh, in some cases, as I understood it, uh, agreeing on 
you know, the key, uh, you know, themes of intervention could also be a very difficult uh, task in terms of getting, getting consensus. What is your reaction to what you've heard so far? Uh, thank you, Eric. I guess I, I'll put it in a different terms. I wouldn't consider it as small uh, compared to the number of people that live uh, inside these countries. We have more people abroad than at home. Uh, our diaspora in terms of um, sort of remittances at home uh, consists of 15% of our GDP. Uh, however, I wouldn't put uh, sort of the remittances as the only vehicle for diaspora engagement, which unfortunately, unfortunately most governments across the world have been sort of uh, as a sort of that their mantra, it's remittances. But I think we have to go uh, on the multiple ways of engagement that we talked about, like diaspora being major source for FDI, for market development, including outsources, outsourcing opportunities for technology transfer or knowledge transfer, like through the engagement of scientific community of diasporic member, philanthropy, tourism, but also for political, for political contributions, right? Uh, we have many countries across the world allowing uh, the diaspora members to vote at home, which have a huge potential to turn elections upside down. For example, in the case of Kosovo, for the first time, we have had a major sort of diaspora co contribution in terms of uh, government formation. Uh, for the first time, we've had the numbers that have increased from some 20,000 voters to close to 200,000 voters, right? So it has changed completely the political scene uh, in a matter of, uh, you know, uh, an overnight election. Uh, and that has happened also in multiple other countries. So we see more and more diaspora communities becoming a vocal voice into the future uh, of uh, countries of origin. I think what is important here to point out, and Odir was talking about resources, right, and uh, mobilizing these resources. I think, you know, knowing who is who and what they do is key element, but then moving that into uh, and uh, sort of if you were to do a design thinking aspect of it, a prototype of engagement, what are some of the venues? I think uh, often the biggest mistake that diaspora organization make is trying to be a catch all entity where they try to fit everything uh, in terms of diaspora engagement. And then uh, they end up being overwhelmed and overworked in terms of, of the deliverables that they have to do. So I think in that aspect, there has to be a broader consensus, consensus among diaspora networks and organization to first of all, try to take care of themselves, right? There is a need for a developer for the development of diaspora organization. And I think that's where uh, organizations and donors, uh, bigger donors that have been providing uh, resources in play have to think and then they have to go beyond uh, the normal type of funding, right? Uh, Odia mentioned that it's hard for, uh, you know, a donor community to provide support to unstructured diaspora community. And that's correct. But in order to structure that community, also diaspora communities need a developer of their development. And that to say there will be no direct uh, output for a donor to say tangible activity A, B, this, this many people participate in, et cetera. But it's more like having faith on, uh, I think, uh, diaspora engagement in general needs a bit more faith from the donor community in terms of uh, taking a risk, right? Taking a risk to elevate uh, this um, field to another level. And I think that comes with providing more resources into it, but also uh, bringing the theme about not just, you know, the money aspect is one that you could leverage remittances. You could uh, try to uh, sort of rechannel remittances into SMEs local. You could try to find diaspora angel investors to create for a home. You could invite, you could, you could sort of build your little Silicon Valley in whatever city you are. And we've seen this with the case of sort of the Bangalore boom in India. We've seen it with, in the case of Israel, uh, with, a, with a scene of startups. We've seen it in other countries, but I've also seen it firsthand here in the Balkans, where we have multiple diaspora members who have actually invested not just that, not just the tre treasure, right? They've invested their time and talent. Because I think often the biggest focus and the biggest problem among uh, the, the, I guess, civil society organization is that, look, the money is diminishing. I happen to be on the side of, of, of the aisle that thinks we have so much money, we don't know what to do with them. So that's why for the organization I work with and I found it, uh, the, the key mantra is co-creation with diaspora, right? We've got to co-create an elements of sort of not just providing, 
you know, providing a space, a convenient space for people together uh, and mobilize them. But also we have to put more uh, resources in terms of capacity building and scaling up that Im the potential impact and also not being afraid of potential failures that come along the way. And I think often diaspora uh, investment has been very carefully curated with the idea that we invest in fund X because we want to find, we want to get exactly this output. And often that hasn't been the case because it's not a community that is also one catch fits all. It's a community that has diverse interests. It's a community that brings different walks of life, but it's also a community where, that it matters the most how they left the country. And often the sad reality is that people leave uh, for multiple reasons, but one of the major re reasons for why they leave is because they want a better life. They don't think that the country of origin is offering them the capacity to fulfill that potential. And I think knowing that and knowing the fact that they can, they, they believe that they cannot make it at the country of origin for a certain time doesn't mean that that will remain for the rest of their life. And I would love us to also focus on hard data. We got to start investing on data aspect of the diaspora engagement. We have very little hard data to, 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 to present all the potential influence that the diaspora have on different scenes, right, of the development. And I think in that aspect, you know, I would, I would want to see what is, it, what is it the journey of potentially 100 migrants living in different parts of the world in a matter of understanding the empirical data for, uh, you know, a, a year, 50 years period or something like that so that we could understand what are the elements better. The other aspect of it is that we got to build a bit of more par partnership platform. And what that means is often the donors come with and sort of their major strategy, the bilateral donors, multilateral donors in the country of origin. And every donor has their sort of strategy, and I understand. But often when it comes on the ground and when it comes to diaspora entities, there needs to be a coordination. So there needs to be a coordination among the donor side. So we uh, reduce a bit the duplication of efforts. I don't know how many studies I've read on diaspora engagement that kind of replicate uh, replicate the same thinking within this, within a similar scope of, scope of projects, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then the second aspect of it, I think, is that we got to in, we got to invest more on uh, sort of. Uh, change makers, the, the young agent. I feel the more where I've seen it based on my, my experience of over a decade of working with Albanian diaspora is that funding is not an issue. Trust is an issue. We lack of trust is the key issue to get diaspora to give in terms of where they're going. So, but in order to give, there also a needs, there's also a need to build a robust system of responding to that donor, right? Whether like there was a contribution uh, from someone in the audience that said, you know, like we have different type of donor. Are we going after the corporate world? Are we going after individual donors? Are we going after only ethnically based donors, like only Albanians following the cause of Albanians? But you know how many Albanians have married non-Albanians? You know, uh, sort of uh, the tagline of just being Albanian is not the only layer that could connect you to Kosovo, Albania, or a particular country. There's other elements within identity that could connect you. It is definitely an entry point. And I think the other part is looking into diaspora community, particularly looking at small developing countries for nation branding, one, and two, for access to new market. And access to new market by having diaspora member be the facilitator of that next investor, of that next tourist, of that next uh, uh, sort of change maker that could potentially relocate for example and to give to be, give you a big um a small example for a big potential impact like we yeah. we have another on the ground a girl that moved from zurich to pristina to establish a calling center like you would think that's very simple but that particular person by moving the operation from zurich to pristina she opened 300 job on the ground and made her the buzz of the town right yeah. one yeah. And to um, reduce the cost of her operation, because the life, li the, the cost of operating in Pristina versus in, in Zurich is a different, different right. example. But also within right. Zurich, uh, I don't think it would be. I, I don't think you will be the buzz of the town with such a small activity. But right. and that's where it becomes the meaning for young entrepreneurs who want to test out their ideas and want to find a place where it could be, even their risk could be cheaper. So sure, to speak. sure, sure, understood. So there's multiple ways. No, absolutely. I mean, there, there's a lot to uh, to unpack there uh, on the the country branding. Uh, you know, I think the, the 
you know, the, the uh, benchmark uh, there in terms of a, you know, a positioning shift uh, was Ireland coming out of 2008 uh, with the, the same similar program you talked about where they mm -hmm. provided uh, monetary incentives to the diaspora, you know, to help relocate uh, corporations. They introduced a whole new uh, fiscal strategy to attract, uh, you know, large organizations like Google and Facebook and others to relocate to Ireland. And it was massively successful, 350,000 jobs over, you know, an extended period of time. And of the, you know, PIGSs, Portugal, uh, Ireland, uh, Greece, and, and Spain, they stood out as a, a massive success in terms of turnaround. So the branding element, uh, I think, is, is, is certainly important. That, that goes to, you know, a policy initiative, which is initiated uh, internally. Uh, I think Israel is, you know, does the same thing. And so did India. Uh, when, uh, when Modi took over, he went on a massive campaign uh, to speak to the diaspora. He was able to pack 100,000 people in, uh, in stadiums in the, in the U.S. And the result was $54 billion dollars in uh, transfers into uh, Indian banks over uh, uh, between 2014 and 2019. Massive achievement, uh, followed by massive changes in terms of financial sector reform, uh, diaspora accounts, diaspora investment accounts, uh, special treatment in terms of fiscal, fiscal status. So clearly those, those, uh, those exist. What I, what I did like about one of the comments you made, which, which again links up to what Mbimba uh, and what uh, you know, Professor Binod have said is, is really thinking out of the box when it comes to uh, the role of diaspora associations, right? So, uh, you know, the traditional, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, activity of organizing uh, events and, and connecting is not sufficient, uh, you know, to really attract, uh, you know, uh, uh, funding from the diaspora as well as support and skills and services from the diaspora. You need to do more. You need to you know, engage deeply with the country. You need to look at how you can create investment opportunities. You need to look at ways of creating relocation opportunities, such as the, the, you know, the, the call center example. So clearly that gives us a fairly broad landscape of, of different uh, solutions. I'd like to take uh, two more comments. Uh, one from Odile, given sort of the, the, the policy perspective, uh, uh, commenting obviously on what Mbimba uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Badia have said, as well as uh, um, uh, Professor Bugia have also said about mobilizing you know, domestic resources. Uh, and, and since you are engaging not only with the diaspora uh, organizations, but you're also engaging with, uh, with groups inside of the, of the country of origin, can you speak to those, uh, to those issues uh, from a policy standpoint, uh, Odile? Thank you very much, uh, Eric. Um, that, that's a very important point, and this is also linked with the, the point raised by um, Lisa on trust. Not only trust among the diaspora member, but trust with the countries of origin and the countries of their destination, or at least the host countries the diaspora is in. Because if we come back to, to, to where we are coming from, right? Um, and, and maybe we can take the example of the Gambia because, because you mentioned it earlier. There was this change of government in um, 2017 in the Gambia. And basically that's the moment when the diaspora became much more active in at least wishing to reinvest in the country and all of that. And at that moment, Switzerland engaged with the new government in the Gambia to try to work on the framework condition to attract more diaspora investment, but also, you know, the, the voting rights of the diaspora for the next election, um, the passport being recognized, all these kind of things, dual citizenship dialogue and all that. And, and actually to create, again, this, this framework um, and condition that we were, we were discussing about. And, and here we engage basically as Switzerland, so as a donor country, but also as a state, you know, with the state of the Gambia to discuss about how they reach out to their um, diaspora and what would be needed in terms of policy and all of that. And this was very much possible because um, there was a change of government and because most of the people from the diaspora were keen on engaging with the new government. And obviously um, uh, you can correct me, uh, Jabi, but, but that was, 
there, there was really a momentum at this stage to, to engage. And, and that's very interesting. And this comes from this trust, right? Because also this notion of trust, we, and, and, and in the Balkan, uh, Lisa mentioned it, it's been also um, a, a big issue to try to, to really, as a, as a state and as a development agency and as a donor supporter of diaspora organization, we really try to, to engage with the countries of origin and in the country of destination, obviously, as, as uh, being the host country, to try to, to, to have this framework condition enabling um, a diaspora contribution to the, the country of origin. Because this trust has been often lacking at the time the people were leaving the country. It, it's not, um, it might not be uh, relevant for the second or third generation, but for the first generation, it's very relevant. And, and it's only when we will have some trust rebuilt that we will have a successful systemic impact because what we want is not just a one-off investment of the diaspora here or there. We want some systematic engagement, you know, sustainability in the relationship and all that. Not one organization does that and then five years later, this organization does not exist anymore and the beneficiaries in the country of origin are not receiving any benefits anymore, you know? So, so in terms of long-term and all that, you really have to, to, to reach the different level. And this is the same, you were mentioning it, Eric, uh, for remittances only, not only for diaspora contribution, but, but really strictly remittances. I mean, if you don't have the regulatory um, um, framework in place, you will, you will have no impact because, because you cannot invest, you cannot have saving. So we have to engage sometimes with the central banks, you know, on these issues of remittances and all that. So, so that's also where, where it comes to, to policy enabling environment, which, which I was uh, mentioning at the, at the beginning of my in um, intervention. Thank you very much. Great, wonderful, thank you. Um, to complete, uh, our uh, geographical spread. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Mary Simmons from uh, Barbados, is that correct? If I'm, if I'm uh, reading my notes correctly, uh, to give us the perspective on these issues uh, from the Caribbean, uh, you know, from the Caribbean region. Uh, we've covered Asia, we've covered Africa, uh, the Americas and uh, 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 Central America, and, and now uh, we, we will get uh, some comments uh, from the uh, from the Caribbean, uh, Dr. Simmons, uh, do you care to comment? Uh, I think you you're muted. Yeah. Great. Hi, I'm gonna keep my um, <laughs> my photo on because I'm um, in a place I wasn't expecting to speak today, but uh, I really have to say that I have really enjoyed the presentation. And, um, and there are many similarities between um, issues that have been raised by uh, the speakers from Europe and also from Africa. Um, uh, the um, couple of things I would like to say is the, uh, the, uh, from, from Barbados, I would say our government has been um, encouraging the diaspora involvement, uh, and they've been doing this for over 20 years, but the, the engagement has not been as vibrant as um, it could be, certainly from creating the enabling environment for diaspora um, participation. So I think, I think there's a lot more work to be done. Um, to create that. Uh, I do agree that um, there is more work even for diaspora organizations, um, say in the US where I'm based, um, to come together uh, and to work together. There have been attempts um, on the part of the Barbadian organizations to create an umbrella organization um, and um, to, to create a basis for collecting um, joint funding to uh, make contributions in uh, areas of need. I would say that um, I have been involved in a diaspora organization for about three or four years now. 
And what I find is that there is, um, the focus tends to be on contributing to um, kind of welfare needs. And uh, some, some, um, some organizations are alumni associations and therefore they also contribute to um, educational needs at the levels of the school, but there is potential to do you know, a lot more. Um, I was quite um, impressed to learn about what the Ethiopian organization is doing in creating a joint um, development fund. And I think there's a lot of um, potential uh, for, for doing that. Uh, uh, I have to speak to Barbados. There, there are a lot of diaspora organizations across the Caribbean, so I'll speak specifically to Barbados. Um, funding is always an issue. Um, we also found that there was a very great response during COVID. And I would say that um, COVID was also gave an opportunity for more focus engagement uh, and, and, and the government did pre, you know, create conditions where resources could be targeted. So I would say that the effort uh, and the commitment that have been expressed um, by the government were realized during the COVID era and there is more work to build on that. Uh, so, for example, I'll just give uh, an example. There was a, an adopt a family fund which was um, established by the government. And uh, one of the challenges in the absence of an umbrella organization was um, how to channel the resources, you know, in the easiest way. And uh, I would say that there was very great collaboration um, between the government and creating the possibilities for money to be sent by check or, you know, just facilitating that. And so I, I think during the COVID um, era, uh, we learned a lot about how collaboration could be possible when um, there is a focused intervention. Um, I would say that there's been a lot of effort um, over the past three years by the government to engage the diaspora, uh, but, let me say but, but uh, and I think there is uh, more work to be done to, to, to build I would even say build capacity of diaspora associations so that the um, assistance that is being provided could be more focused. Mm -hmm. um, I was interested to, 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 to hear the discussion around uh, crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that with more focus um, areas of collaboration um, linked to crowdfunding um, and, and creating um, a single fund to which um, people could make their contribution, uh, that, would, that would actually make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, the question of trust is always there. Uh, one of the things I've found over the past three years is that um, there in New York, say, there are about 20 organizations, and some of them are, uh, I think as the speaker from Switzerland said, um, some are informal and some are formalized. And I would say that our consulate has really been working to encourage um, associations to formalize using the structures that are available here in the U.S., like the, the 501 c establishing associations as 501 c because that lends to the credibility of the association, accountability, which contributes to, to trust. 
Uh, let me see if there's anything else I want to add. Um, yeah. I, I found the discussion about connecting with investments uh, rather interesting and, and with um, job creation. We have not been doing uh, so much of that. So I think there are opportunities to to look at to look at that and to engage. I mean, there is a commitment to engaging in dialogue with the diaspora, but there is room for more specific um, discussion on areas where the diaspora can collaborate. One of the observations I would like to make is that um, what it is sometimes difficult for diaspora organizations to make a contribution because there is at the national level sometimes resistance. Um, so that's, that's part of the dialogue um, to say, okay, you're coming in from outside and the way you do things outside is different from the way you're doing it. Um, we get that type of tension. Mm -hmm. And so there is, um, although there is a commitment at the level of the government to enhance that for relationships, there is also room for more uh, awareness creation mm -hmm. about the value addition mm -hmm. that uh, people in the diaspora can make. And I think that's out there now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, thank you for that. I mean, there, there's, uh, you know, there, there's a lot there in terms of, uh, um, uh, in terms of experience specific to the, um, uh, specific to the Caribbean. And I have some experience there, my, my wife being from, uh, from San Lucia. Um, uh, I'd like to make uh, uh, just a few comments uh, to try to round out the, the, what we've discovered and what we've learned. Uh, and then maybe take a, a, a couple more comments and then open up for, for, for Q&A before uh, we close out in, uh, in 15 minutes. Um, so as I understand it, uh, on the one hand, uh, the context is that diaspora organizations are, are struggling in the face of dwindling uh, traditional support, uh, meaning the, uh, the institutions that would normally provide grants, uh, et cetera, or being uh, uh, you know, uh, constrained uh, and that constraint is growing and therefore the availability of resources to address the needs uh, of these organizations and the work that they're doing um, is, being, uh, is being challenged. Uh, on the other hand, we have sort of uh, an innovative way of, of looking at things uh, represented by a few members of the panel and, uh, and uh, audience commenters. One is that a substitute, a, an interested substitute uh, to these sources of, uh, 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 of, uh, of funds uh, in kind and or in cash uh, is the diaspora themselves. And what drives uh, their motivation is what is it that the organization is focused uh, on, right? Uh, is it focused on you know, traditionally uh, you know, doing uh, you know, activities that don't necessarily address some of the immediate concerns that the diaspora have, uh, you know, convening conferences, uh, having uh, discussion panels about the problems that exist, et cetera, versus uh, an approach where uh, the focus is on providing solutions. Uh, taking the example, the very dynamic example of, of India, very dynamic example of, uh, of Albania and of Ireland, which we talked about. And that focus on solutions has essentially three um, prongs, as I understand it. One, there's philanthropy. So how do you engage a diaspora to support um, your work within the context of philanthropy? There we, we, we get the, the example uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Binod pr you know, provided, uh, the example of the Ethiopians, very successful example um, that uh, I, uh, I talked about. And then um, you have services, which Dr. Binod talked about with the uh, looking at the, the physicians, the Indian physicians, and how they are reacting in periods of crises and how they are continuing to provide um, expertise and support uh, uh, you know, to 
uh, to the home to the home country. Uh, and then we have a, the, the larger platform, which Evelyn talks about, which is you know beginning to to um, reverse the brain drain, bring back this knowledge, this expertise in a more formal way in the context of of a, an academic framework. You know, to which I suggested that maybe that academic framework needs to open up. Uh, to be an incubator uh, to solve problems such as uh, youth unemployment, uh, policy advocacy, and a few other uh, other elements, um, which I think could be a very dynamic, a dynamic uh, way to proceed. And then the third one uh, is uh, you know investments. Now investments clearly, as as we discussed, has uh, uh, challenges. Uh, on the one hand, you have uh, the least talked about uh, biggest challenge, which is uh, 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 regulatory constraints around securities and the abil ability to bring to market in the host country uh, investment propositions that meet uh, regulatory compliance. Very difficult issue. We've attempted to do it uh, at Homestrings and we have the scars to, uh, you know, to show it. Whether you're using crowdfunding, which has uh, uh, investor qualification limitations, uh, or you're doing uh, 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 capital raising for specific invest, uh, investment opportunities, which has, again, uh, qualification uh, uh, requirements. Um, uh, so those are the, you know, the elements that, I, that I've seen. But, but the key driving point here is uh, uh, the organization, the diaspora organizations, to focus on solutions uh, to the problems that the diaspora are having. Uh, they want to repatriate. They want to start a business back home. They're seeking investments from the network. Uh, they want to expand uh, their network in order to tap in expertise to help them implement uh, uh, back home. Those are the kinds of issues based on this conversation that really drive motivation and drive people to, you know, to support uh, the, uh, the organization. Um, with respect to where are the resources, I think the very good point that Dr. Bugua made is that you know, the resources are back home, which brings, uh, brings me to another element which we discovered. Um, this uh, need to want to bring investment opportunities uh, to the host country and have and, and face the difficult challenges of formalizing those investments, et cetera, is a very difficult thing and not necessarily the optimal solution. What we have found uh, is in fact the opposite. Uh, and that uh, the investment opportunities can be structured in a formal way, in a transparent way, in a credible way back home. Uh, those investments can be linked. Uh, those opportunities can be linked formally through a brokerage account that is linked to um, uh, the diaspora's uh, bank account. Uh, so we recently advised the uh, regulator for French-speaking uh, uh, Africa uh, and they are now working with uh, the domestic banks to create uh, investment accounts within the savings accounts uh, so that those uh, investment accounts are linked to the exchange, linked to venture capital funds, linked to private equity funds, so that the diaspora simply has to transfer money into their, their bank accounts back home. Uh, and then they can instruct the, the, uh, the bankers to allocate you know, 5% or 10% or monies into their investment accounts. And they can monitor that online using digitization. Uh, in that way, uh, you circumvent all of the uh, uh, constraints that the host country presents. Uh, and at the same time, you are deepening local capital markets by simply allocating you know, investment funds through your bank account. It also deepens the banking market because diaspora who don't have domestic bank accounts will then open up bank accounts and, and therefore strengthen the, the local uh, banking system. We've seen that in India. Uh, we've obviously seen it uh, in, uh, in, in other countries uh, uh, as well. Um, uh, the last point uh, I, I want to make, uh, and, and I think this is, uh, um, uh, it, this is important, and it has to do with, uh, uh, with innovation. Uh, I think as diaspora, we bring significant amount of expertise. Um, and uh, as, as uh, Lisa was talking, uh, about you know, we need to use that expertise and that experience uh, of both having lived, uh, 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 coming from our home country, but living abroad, a unique perspective on solutions that make sense uh, back home. And I think uh, using the diaspora organizations as a channel uh, 
uh, you know, to uh, uh, to push through those innovations is cle clearly important. Um, I would again overemphasize uh, uh, Everland's uh, you know platform uh, as a uh, you know potential uh, paradigm shifting uh, you know opportunity uh, to leverage that uh, that platform in um, you know in that context. Um, I'm going to stop here, and I'd like to open it up for uh, questions from the uh, from the audience. If we have uh, any. Uh, questions or comments from the audience. Uh, we have about seven minutes to go uh, formally. Or comments and questions from uh, any of the panelists as well. Uh, I can't see the hands, so I'm going to rely on uh, my trusted uh, uh, administrative support. Oh, no hands. Okay, great. Uh, so we are finishing with, uh, you know, seven minutes ago. Uh, Professor Camelia. But Eric, I think there's also some questions in the chat. So perhaps oh, I, I can't. Uh, uh, there's, questions. there's some comments, contribution and questions that you might. Yeah, I think some of those uh, have been addressed through, uh, uh, through our uh interaction so uh larissa is there anything in the chat that we haven't covered oh paddy anything in the chat that we haven't covered uh, i think eric all um relatively covered unless some of the panelists would like to react with some additional points thank you yeah thanks yeah. uh wow this is amazing Finishing with six minutes to spare. Uh, just in, uh, have, uh, Dr. Paj, uh, Raj Badui's uh, comment, please. You can okay. pass the uh, word to him, please. Yes, uh, uh, please, uh, please go ahead, Dr. Ranju. Oh, you're driving. Uh, so, you know, uh, just uh, turn on the, uh, the mic and please go ahead. Ah, okay. So yeah, you're, you're driving. So you, um, yeah, she's unable to, and it wouldn't be safe either uh, as well. Um, just to, just to let you know, um, I was trying to follow the count as we were discussing, we've, uh, broken through 50 in terms of attendees, which is a, a very impressive, uh, yeah, can you hear me? Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Please, uh, please go ahead. I'm just, uh, I'm so sorry, I'm driving down, but then still like safe on this side. But then uh, I remember I could, I have posted something when I was in the office, and that was that how do diaspora integration policies in the host countries and the pro diaspora policies on the home countries raise social inclusions and belonging issues. This is something which I had been um, uh, I had been working out for quite some time and I was not able to figure out with the right uh, answers either. I wish, I hope uh, our panelists who are so experienced would really would guide me out with this one. I can hear the sounds very well, but then we have a prohibition of um, talking while driving, but then listening while driving is, uh, <laughs> I, it is, it is accepted. Yeah, it's safer. Uh, safer, absolutely. Th thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Ranju. Uh, any of the panelists would like to to pick that uh, that question up? Uh, the, the issue of uh, uh, diaspora integration uh, in the uh, host country uh, versus uh, diaspora engagement uh, in the home country. Uh, the issues of belonging. Um, any comments around that? Particularly when you're talking about second and third generation. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Lisa Riddle at uh, George Washington has written extensively about uh, the erosion of commitment and attachment uh, as the generations, you know, uh, uh, as the generations are, are, are created away from the home country. Any, any comments on that from any of the diaspora organization leaders? Do you find challenges around these issues? Um, Eric, if I can say something briefly, I, I think, yes, there are challenges there, but I am... Um... Like um, as the Africa Center Ireland, our own experiences of integration and inclusion, I think it has to start with the diaspora themselves and actually try to see, um, to work with other communities as well 
And then in doing that, also there are few people who are actually in Ireland here who has experience of being migrants themselves. So you actually look at that and bring everyone on board because like it's actually funny because it's just recently in Ireland when you talk about diaspora, they all, the, the, the only notion is the Irish diaspora, but we have to actually engage with the government as well to look into our own integration. And back home, I think uh, countries of origin is something that we experience as well as uh, Odile mentioned, like the, the Gambia government, for example, the elections, that, uh, the, the, the dictator leave, uh, losing election in 2016 doesn't happen without the, the diaspora engagement. We set up a lot of WhatsApp groups, like people contribute. We even put pressure on the political parties to come together to form a coalition. So I think those are some of the things the diaspora could do as well back home. But it's other way the diaspora has to really take the decision themselves and take some responsibility of their integration and what they do at home as well. So it has to come from them. Understood. Wonderful. Uh, on that note, I uh, uh, would like to thank you for uh, your participation, both uh, the panelists giving uh, really in-depth uh, analysis and, and comments. Um, and then obviously the respondents, uh, you know, raising uh, critical issues. I'd like to pass the microphone uh, for closing remarks um, you know, to uh, Dr. Uh, Raj Bardoui uh, of uh, GRFDT uh, 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 to close us out. Uh, thank you again for the uh, opportunity. Uh, Dr. Raj. Okay. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hello? Yeah, you can. Um, hi, uh, greetings to all of you and thank you for giving me the opportunity to say a few words after all these various panelists and discussants uh, played their part. I have to say it was a very rich discussion and insightful presentations. Um, it becomes very difficult to make the final remarks except to perhaps uh, uh, focus on a few areas that have come out very clearly. One, uh, before we can talk about engaging the, the diaspora in home country development or activities, where are they? Who are they? What kind of, what do they represent? Are they professional? Are they business people? Are they um, um, professors, are they, what's the nature? In other words, it would be good to have some kind of mapping and that will of course be country specific. So where they are, what they do, what their capacities, what their potentials, what their resources are before we say, okay, you know, this is an amazing unlimited pot and we can just go there and take some. So what, are, what's, what does the scene look like? For me, I would be very much interested to see and in fact, I will be embarking on a small study Hello, in the Caribbean, the Eastern. Another Sorry? You can't hear? Hello? No, we, we can hear. Oh, you can hear me. A study yeah. to, to map out just that, where the Caribbean, perhaps I will focus on Eastern Caribbean because it's easier. That's where uh, Dominica, that's where I belong. So, so that is the, the, I think this is one of the areas where the diaspora organizations are active to see, to take stock of who they are, what they are, what their potentials are, what role they have played. And we know that diaspora has always been very, very active in their countries, uh, whether it's social development or whether it is uh, philanthropy, whether addressing to crisis situations, uh, they are always there. Okay. But are they being effectively, uh, I'm not saying utilized, but is their contribution being effectively realized? Let me put it this way. In other words, even though they're putting in their resources, whether they are doing it through kind or whether it's through their experience, whether through their perceptions of how things or ideas, networking, uh, or, or indeed their financial resources, are these being effectively realized? So we are talking about mobilizing, how we can mobilize the resources, but are they making a bigger impact than we can see on the ground? 
And I think it has been uh, some of the presentations as well as discussions alluded, alluded to the need to focus the diaspora activities on certain sectors, sectoral engagement to maximize. So if, for example, um, there's a need for schools or health or um, infrastructure or whatever the issue may be in a certain area, in a certain community, I believe that community interventions, in my view, I'm a development economist, we can go from below up. But if we are talking about overall national development, I think we can leave it to those who are responsible for that. But the diaspora as a stakeholder, if indeed they are recognized as a stakeholder, I'm not too sure. So we need to find out from the various, uh, well, the governments or the policy makers, what is the option of it? Is it to get their resources or is it to give them a seat at the table? if that is possible? Is it to engage them more uh, actively than to rely on their resources? And no wonder then they do things what they think they feel comfortable with. They will do acts of philanthropy whenever this is needed because they, I, in my view, are not given uh, a place at the table and this has political reasons. Those who left their home because of their political uh, beliefs, of course, they have another um, attitude towards this. So what I'm saying, two or three things I would like to say, we need to know who they are, what their resources are like, okay? And what their networking is like. Because after having lived in the case of the Caribbean, the Caribbean diaspora you'll find in the US, in Canada, in England, largely, and they have built networks. They are doing things. Mary Simmons is the one who has done work on on, on the Caribbean diaspora, I haven't, I just have an appreciation of this. So let's, let's do this sort of, you know, uh, some initial work on mapping. And if one needs to involve the donors with the um, diaspora um, engagement, we also need to see how then the home countries engage. And this is where partnership is coming. And we have some examples in Chile, in Mexico with community activities were done with the help of uh, diaspora, federal government, state government, local government, and indeed the private sector to address some of the issues in a particular community. And I think at that time it was Zacatecas. I don't know if it still exists. So things like that, areas where there's a dire need for the social infrastructure or infrastructure, physical infrastructure, Perhaps efforts need to be mobilized to have selective interventions, which would be more, in my view, effective than bits here, bits there. Of course, they always contribute. Diaspora is a social change agent. Of course, they bring social change. This brings social development. But to see how then, and where the capacities are limited, how that capacity could be improved. And this is where I think I bring in the donors. If the diaspora is doing a credible job and making an impact and their contribution is realized, whether it is through appreciation by the governments, whether through awards, whether it's through some other way of bringing them over, giving them some special, um, if not the seat, but special recognition, then of course the donors will also realize there is some work happening here and maybe we need to support their work. And as uh, I think it was Odile or Lisa, I don't know if it was Lisa who said, donors are skeptical because they don't know if their funds will be used for political activities or for indeed economic and social development activities. So the, there's, there's quite a bit, there's quite a bit and indeed the diaspora needs in terms of having associations and some in some places, stations do exist. So you have either the community level associations or you have um, at, at, at the level of the district or at the level of uh, uh, perhaps state. So you have, once they're organized, once there is a consolidation, that's um, Hore was saying, that their organization has chapters in different states. So that means they, through networking, they network and those associations network is then further consolidated and network to realize 
where their potentials are and how they could be, they could be utilized. Um, and in, in my view, too much emphasis for the diaspora has been placed on re financial resources. I think we have lost the other side of it, which is the non-financial resources, which eventually translate into financial. Because if you use your, if, if you use their consulting services or their knowledge or their networking, you're using their time, which translates into money. So I think this thing, we can't do it because we don't have the money. Yes, we can. At what stage do you need money? Prior to doing something, you have to conceive of what is needed and how it will be done, who will do it, what sort of ideas, what sort of tools will be needed. And I think this is where the capacity of the, uh, in my view, diaspora could be um, explored and, and utilized. Um, as regards crowdfunding, um, matching schemes exist. I refer to the Mexican and the Chilean. And more recently, when St. Vincent in the Caribbean had this uh, volcanic eruption, there was a lot of mobilization of funds, not only by the Caribbean community, but also out, outside by international organizations where people are working, for example, in the World Bank, in the United Nations, there was matching scheme. Certain organizations said, we will put in $100,000 if you are able to mobilize $100,000. And indeed, $200,000 were mobilized for that specific uh, humanitarian purposes or rebuilding purposes. So there is so much the diaspora can do. And these were not only diaspora, this was an open call. So it was more than the diaspora. So that's the other way perhaps diaspora can uh, improve its uh, resources by uh, inviting their friends where they live to have some kind of dialogue with them. They can become members of an organization even though they may not belong to that uh, country. So there are ways that the resources can be uh, uh, mobilized. Um, and, and as regards taking, as Eric is saying, innovation is the key. That is the engine of development. So you have people in certain countries, they are well resourced in terms of networking, in terms of their knowledge, in, in terms of their abilities. And uh, that can be utilized, the, um, those potentials uh, to innovate. Um, some of the experiences, for example, I give you the example of the Ford uh, Motor Company, which was started by um, an Irish, uh, man Ford diaspora. And after working for a long time, uh, and he came from Cork, I think in Ireland, after working for Ford or starting this company in Detroit, after a long period of experience, he went back to start the business in Cork, Ford company. So it is, it is possible. It's the question of the abilities, the potentials and the status of the diaspora members. If they're still in a limbo, obviously, the concerns are different. If they are well-established, well-resourced, have stable jobs, have stable uh, uh, sources of income and have established themselves as a reputable member of the community in which they are sort of living, residing, then I think it is good to, to look for people who can then be uh, a change, a game changers in their home countries. Um, I think um, I have covered and certain areas that I think it would be nice to do some research in would be uh, the areas of um, uh, some of the areas, uh, for example, where there is scope for such uh, development funds. Korea has, Korea has a large diaspora. Korea has this uh, one person set up this fund, DO fund, and DO fund is for the development of Korea, and that is the diaspora fund. Um, their skills capacity being harnessed through Africa recruit, if it still exists, I'm not too sure if it does. So there are very many ways that the diaspora can be actively engaged. The question we have to ask of ourselves is how ready the host or the home countries are, how ready and receptive they are to uh, not only reaching out to accepting them as partners. Would they be development partners or would they be just doing ad hoc as and when there is a need for humanitarian work or as and when certain social projects need to be done 
or would they be actively engaged? Yes, some countries have set up certain uh, structures in their ministries of external affairs or wherever ministries, and they can reach out to them, consulates reach out to them. Uh, sometimes politicians reach out to their, uh, the, the diaspora to get their votes. I don't want to quote, but we know. So once you've got the vote, and that's, that's that, they will succeed in trying you in, vote for them, and you go back. Now, if that is the level of engagement, then that is different. And how do diaspora feel, whether they are recognized, their contribution is recognized, or whether they would do something just for their community and be happy with that. So I think that these are certain open-ended areas and uh, issues in my mind that one needs to reflect on uh, as researchers and uh, to say, okay, it's so about time that the guys were after having sacrificed in a way, leaving home, going to another place, and then starting to sacrifice again back to the home where they left because they have, it's, it's their sense of belonging, but they also need to get the recognition um, and all diasporas, people from Sweden, Norway, uh, Finland, Switzerland, and so on, those who came to the United States um, uh, in the 18th century and so on, they are being, their connections are being reestablished. And I think if I'm not wrong, there is a diaspora parliament, um, I think in one of the countries, I don't know if it's Switzerland, in all of these countries, to bring the diaspora, bring their people back, and to involve them in the decision-making activities of their countries. Admittedly, these are smaller countries and it's, I suppose, easier to do it. But these are some of the areas. I think this is, this is something not small. Diaspora contributions is not small. It is quite visible, uh, particularly that migration is not going to go away. People will continue to, to migrate. Maybe the pattern uh, and the format of the market migration may change um, as doors are tightened up for people to come in. But they are going to be there and there will be larger and larger diaspora. So I think this is uh, an area perhaps uh, home countries need to reflect more than the resources of the diaspora. So I think. Thank you very much. I stop at that and I hope I did not go beyond my time. I didn't look at the time when I started. Um, so I have to say it was a very, very fruitful, enjoyable and very, very motivating discussion and contribution. Thank you to all of you. And thank you for moderating the discussion so well, Harry. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, on that note, uh, we are closed unless Paddy uh, or, uh, uh, Pai, would you like to close us out from a, a home a housekeeping standpoint? Um, Eric, thank you. I think we are really beyond time, maybe just to thank all the participants and to remind them that we would be having the third Global Diaspora Virtual Exchange on the 17th of June, and if they can watch out on the social media platforms. Thank you again. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you again to all the panelists. Eric, if you're still there, thank you. Lisa, thank you. Everlene. Thank you to our translators. <laughs>